Emma knew that Eric wasn't just starved for food. But with Isla only three months old, she wasn't sure if she was ready. But Eric had thought of everything. There was a beautiful crib waiting for Isla. And the walls were thick. During dinner, Eric said, The nanny I've hired should arrive tomorrow. When neither of us is around, she will be able to take care of Isla. Can we trust her? Emma asked. She seems fantastic. Don't worry. She'll take good care of her. Eric understood Emma's worries. He was nervous too, but he had looked into her background and personally interviewed her and was confident that he had made the best decision. After dinner, Emma gave Isla a bath and put her to bed. Then she lay in the bathtub herself until Eric stepped into the bathroom. Isla will be asleep for roughly the next four hours, she told him, smiling. He knelt down beside her and began to unbutton his shirt. Slowly, his perfect body appeared beside her. It had been a long time since the couple had been so intimate. Eric stepped into the bathtub and pulled her into his embrace. What's wrong? Emma asked, noticing Eric's hesitation. I'm worried that your body hasn't fully recovered, he replied. The doctor has already said that I'm fine, she reassured him. Emma wrapped her arms around Eric's neck and whispered into his ear. I want you, she said. Eric could no longer hold back his desires. The two of them stood up and slowly dried each other, then relocated to the bedroom. Afterwards, they lay there for a while with their bodies intertwined. But with the time change and the evening's activity, Emma was completely worn out by the time she woke up the next morning. The nanny arrived first thing. Good morning the nanny said. She was in her early 40s and was obviously not British. Are you American? Emma asked after hearing her accent. Yes, I'm from New York. My name is Barbara. Your husband selected me and brought me all the way over so you could adjust more easily to the lifestyle here, she explained. The woman was obviously extremely understanding. I have a lot of experience with babies, and I'm eager to meet Isla. You can leave her with me without any worries. Where's my husband? She asked. He already headed back to New York this morning. 
Eric had arranged everything, leaving Emma with nothing to worry about. All she had to do was worry about her college. It seemed she would be able to enjoy student life in peace for the next year. To keep a low profile, Emma decided to use the name she had used when she was a model in France, Kira. The college was near the apartment and had produced many famous directors and producers. Emma knew she needed to study hard if she was to develop the skills to go from being an actor to a producer. Most of her classmates came from impressive backgrounds, but Emma had no intention of getting close to any of them. She barely spoke to anyone. Although they didn't say it outright, they found her a little strange. For the first few days, Emma was exhausted. She struggled with much of the professional terminology, and it seemed there was nothing she particularly excelled in. Three days later, another student arrived from New York. Of course, it was none other than the man who had tried everything to get close to Emma. Tommy. Tommy had assumed that Emma would warm to him easily, as he was a fellow American. After class, he asked Emma for a recommendation. I'm new here, he said. I was wondering if you knew any good places to eat nearby. Up ahead, to your right, there's an entire street of restaurants, she told him, before turning and walking off. Tommy stopped her again. Since we're both New Yorkers, do you think we could take care of each other? I can take care of myself. Emma said. Tommy decided not to stop her again. He knew it would only make her dislike him even more. Emma wasn't stupid. After arriving home, she told Eric about Tommy, and Eric quickly did some research. He just signed with Superstar Media, he said. He's the comic book artist and sci-fi lover that George Benedict tried to introduce you to. His brother is also the owner of an entertainment agency. Don't think too much about it, though. It might just be a coincidence. Emma nodded and returned her focus to her studies. The next few days passed by smoothly until the lecturer gave them a group assignment. Emma and Tommy were grouped together, but Emma pleaded with the lecturer to allow her to do it alone. The production of a film isn't the result of just one person. It requires the input of many. So I'm afraid I have to reject your request, he told her. Tommy sat next to Emma 
and smiled at her. After class, as they were leaving, he pulled her to one side. You seem rather unsociable. Not at all like you were in New York. I'm simply trying to keep a low profile during my studies, she explained. No matter who or what you were before, you're just a student now, Tommy said. You still need friends, and you need to cooperate with others. Please, don't push me away. Who knows? We could become great partners. Emma put her books and papers away in her bag and stared hard at Tommy. I'm not stupid, she said. From the look in your eyes, I can see that your real passion is not for your studies. Tommy tilted his head to one side and looked at Emma with curiosity. People used to say that you can read minds. I'm starting to wonder if it's true, he said. My alleged supernatural abilities are irrelevant. I'm not someone you can get close to, so I think it's best if we keep our distance from one another, Emma replied. I hope you'll respect that. You're not exactly easy to get along with, are you? Tommy said. Emma rolled her eyes and left. She soon arrived at the college and was spotted by a group of people who were staring at her. Tommy's prompt arrival was the real source of annoyance for her, though. Why don't you let me help with your movie? He asked her. I made a sci-fi based comedy, which is pretty popular, so I know what I'm doing. Many hands make light work, you know. Emma sighed. You are unbelievably annoying, she responded. He had never expected Emma to reject him outright. But Tommy didn't know that she only opened up to those she was closest to. She's one hell of an ice queen. But I've always liked the challenge, he thought. After learning about how persistent Tommy was, Eric quickly sensed that he was a loose cannon. He never doubted Emma's ability to fend off advances from guys. But there was something about Tommy that made him wary. After a week of studying... Emma felt dejected. Nobody takes me seriously because they think I'm just dabbling, she told Eric. They have no respect for the experience I have at all. I thought it might be like this, but I didn't think it would be this Obvious. Have you been treated unfairly? He asked. Not 
Really? But I am being treated differently, Emma replied. I guess I'm just disappointed that I was right. People can be so thick-headed, Eric said. They shouldn't underestimate you. When Eric had been building Kaleidoscope as a young man, he had had to deal with more than his fair share of people who had underestimated him. He knew that actors in mainstream movies were broadly assumed to be dim-witted and shallow. This view was reinforced by one of Emma's professors during a lecture. When it comes to the art of filmmaking, you have to disregard box office revenues, awards, and large armies of fans. None of those indicate the quality of the movie, he said as he glanced at Emma. The mainstream industry is just a business, not a breeding ground for true artists. Those people have dollar signs in their eyes instead of a true creative vision. Aware that he was pointing the finger at her, as well as a number of people she had worked with, Emma refused to let his comments go. I might respect your opinion more if you were acquainted with the realities of making a movie, she said in front of the other students. Mainstream movies might not always be as sophisticated as art films, but they do make many people happy. Besides, what's the point of making a movie if you don't want as many people as possible to see it? If you don't like what I'm teaching, why are you in my class? The professor asked with a smug grin. He really can't stand me being here, can he? Emma thought. Because, unlike some, I accept that I still have a lot to learn. She responded, wiping the smile from his face. Do you have any idea how long I've been teaching this course? The professor asked. Long enough to know that a college environment should allow for a frank exchange of views rather than the peddling of tired cliches, Emma replied. The other students' eyes bugged out, and the professor's jaw dropped. Eventually, he put himself together again. I don't want to see you in my class again, the professor said. You can sit outside or borrow other people's notes. But I don't want to see your face anymore. Emma closed her textbook and laughed. Well, this has been eye-opening, she said. Get out of my room, the professor said. Emma walked out of the room with her head held high, while Tommy looked on in fascination. She 
really is a force to be reckoned with, he thought. Who gets thrown out of class in less than a week? Tommy decided to excuse himself from the class and follow her outside. But she soon got into Eric's car and disappeared from sight. In the car, Emma wasn't in a talkative mood. Eric sensed something was wrong, so he decided to ask why she had asked him to pick her up early. Did something happen? He asked. Emma shrugged. I basically told my professor that he's an idiot who doesn't know what he's talking about, she replied. Eric laughed loudly. I can see that temper of yours is completely under control. Still, I'm presuming he deserved it. Eric glanced at Emma, and she nodded. What happened after that? He banned me from attending his class again, Emma responded. Really? Eric asked, although he didn't sound too concerned at all. There's nothing these people can teach you that you can't teach yourself. Emma leaned her head against Eric's shoulder. You could have read my mind, she said. They are never going to take me seriously, so I might as well teach myself. It's probably best that I learn in a more practical way anyway. There's nothing like hands-on experience on set. I actually think you should stick with that guy's class. If you back down now, he'll think he was right about you. I would love to see him apologize when he realizes how wrong he was about you. Eric responded. I can't see that happening, Emma said. He'll apologize at some point. Eric told her. It wouldn't be the first time that you've changed someone's opinion of you. Emma thought about it and realized Eric's reasoning made sense. I don't back down when people are stupid enough to try and bully me, she thought. I'm certainly not going to let a washed-up professor get away with it. I think I already know how to deal with this, she said, which made Eric smile at her. This is nothing compared to when you backed away from the acting profession and broke ties with Kaleidoscope, he replied. You can deal with guys like this in your sleep. Emma nodded and took a deep breath. Emma arrived at the professor's class as usual the next morning. He took one look at her and dropped the papers in his hands on his desk. I thought I told you not to bother coming to this class anymore. Are all actors
monsters this dense? Or is it just you? He asked. On second thought, don't bother answering that. Nervous laughter echoed around the room from the other students. But Emma refused to leave her seat. I would love to know if you've actually acted before. Emma looked at the professor, and his bewildered look told her everything she needed to know. I'm guessing you haven't, then. It seems pretty arrogant to pass judgment on everyone in a certain profession if you have no idea what their job actually involves. Do you honestly think I don't have contacts of my own in the industry? The professor asked. We all know how empty-headed and entitled actors are. I'll admit, I've met my own fair share of empty-headed and entitled actors over the years. But some of the people I've worked alongside have been the smartest, most humble individuals I've ever met. Perhaps if you came down from your ivory tower now and again, you might realize how wrong your prejudices are, Emma replied. The professor folded his arms and glared at her. I base my opinions on facts, not prejudices, he said. You only have to look at the nearest magazine to see how awful these people are. Has it ever occurred to you that the stories in these magazines aren't always accurate? I know I've had a number of lies told about me in those things. Emma responded, of course you would say that, the professor spat. Emma shook her head at him and smiled. Frankly, I don't care if you believe me or not, she said. The fact remains that I'm here to learn and the cash I've used to pay my fee is as good as anybody else's here. If you continue to try and bully me out of this classroom over your petty professional jealousy, I'll be happy to make an appointment with the dean to discuss the matter. The professor opened his mouth to speak, but nothing came out. Narrow-minded idiots always shut their mouths when you threaten to go to their superiors, Emma thought. He's clearly bullied people like this before. I'm glad I decided not to walk away. She looked around and saw that the other students were looking at her with a mixture of admiration and surprise. Someone had finally stood up to the professor. Still taken aback by Emma's threat, the professor decided to try and shift everyone's attention from what had just happened. Let's just get started, he said as he handed out papers. Emma bit back a smile 
and felt triumphant. I don't think he'll be bothering me again, she thought. All the while, Tommy was sitting in the corner and watching everything unfold. Emma handled that perfectly, he thought. Anybody else would have buckled under the pressure. He also appreciated the way that she didn't seem to care what anybody else thought of her. The college was full of people who would call a committee to choose the color of their notebooks. So Emma's attitude was a breath of fresh air. In fact, she became famous in the college for standing up to the professor. Some of the students thought she was arrogant, but most were pleased that someone had finally called him out. After the class finished, Emma sent the professor's eyes burning into her back as she left the room. But he wasn't the type of man that she needed to fear. He was far too much of a coward. Tommy caught up to her and gave her a thumbs up. You are the first person who's been brave enough to argue with him, he said. Emma gave a brief nod and walked away, deliberately trying to show him that his advances weren't welcome. Tommy was despondent, but he followed behind her. Why does she have to be so aloof? He wondered. Eric wasn't available, so Emma drove back to the apartment on her own. When she looked in the rearview mirror, she noticed that someone was trailing her, so she sped up. Why is someone snooping around outside? The nanny asked later. Just ignore them, Emma replied as she patted Isla's back. They won't try anything. Our security team would tear them apart, she thought. Don't you feel like it's a violation of your privacy, though? The nanny asked. I've got nothing to hide. They can snoop as much as they want, Emma said. Emma was used to people poking their noses into her business. And she refused to be intimidated by them. The next morning, Emma visited the library and ran into Tommy. It was as if he had figured out she was going to be there and was waiting for her. I don't like being ignored, Tommy said as Emma tried to walk past him. She squared her jaw and glowered at him. And I don't appreciate being threatened, Emma replied. I'm not threatening you. All I want is for us to be friends, Tommy said. Friends. Emma asked. You're stalking me. I'm pretty sure you don't just want to be friends. Tommy grinned at her. So, you have been paying attention to me after all, he said. <laughs> 